Good evening, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Big build up there for Steve Canavan. We've got Steve Canavan as a guest tonight on the Blackpool FC show. Uh, good evening, Steve. How are you? Uh, that's made me feel quite important. I've never seen <laughs> him on the screen like that. That was brilliant. <laughs> 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 it's a great bill though wasn't it yeah uh, we got just go to the comments there right okay we're going to put up our first question for everybody so let's just uh, get to my so for there. those who don't know uh steve used to cover blackpool in the gazette from uh 2002 to 2012 so uh well we'll be talking through uh steve's career and, and what was happening in blackpool at the time and, and and also what steve's up to now and hopefully he might give us a little song later on if oh. we're lucky <laughs> so our first question Good song on is, this channel. Uh, which football team do you support and how did you get into football journalism? Blimey, right. Well, I'm a very football club fan, so it's really weird now because, oh, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it, honestly, it's the strangest feeling there. But for the grace of God, for anyone who supports a different team, because I've kind of gone off football a bit because what, what do you do? Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m., I used to go, when I finished doing Blackpool again, I went back and supported Barry and I was going regularly and home and away. And, um, yeah, I just feel like I've lost a part of my life. It's, it's awful, awful. Um I, don't, I might because I live in St Anne's, so I'm thinking next season of going to Blackpool and start supporting them because I used to. I always you, when you report them for so long, you obviously get a second, a soft spot for them, so they become my second club anyway. So I think right. I'll probably go start supporting Blackpool. But um, yeah, horrible. And football journalism. Uh, I always wanted to be a journalist. Write from a really early age, about nine or ten. Love writing. Bit of a geek. Uh, still am. Still am. Uh, and um, just love words and writing. And um, I was the. I started. I went to did a sports journalism degree at university or a journalism degree, sorry. And then I went to the Bolton Evening News, became their number two writer uh, when Bolton were, were back in the day when Sam Allardyce was manager uh, after he left Blackpool. And then um, and then the job came up as the number one writer. I wanted to be the number one writer for the Blackpool because uh, for for anyone and the Blackpool because I had a job going. Four oh. people. Four people went for the job as football writer, and I was the third choice. Uh, <laughs> oh. Two, True story. I turned up for the interview with, without a tie because I never wear a tie and an open shirt. And apparently, that didn't go down well with the editor at the time. Uh, but but the, other, the first two said no. So I got it by default uh, and in January 2002. And I remember in December 2001, they played. They must have played Charlton, I think, in the FA Cup. Third round, or January, sorry, 2002, they played Charlton away. John Hill scored. Uh, and then Charlton won 2-1, I think. And I watched it on Match of the Day with my dad. And um, and said, oh, you know, we both knew I was cut starting work as the Blackpool Gazette writer. I was dead excited because he looked a really attractive team, played good football. And Steve McMahon was the manager. It was a bit of a, not a hero, but obviously, you know, former England player, Liverpool. I was dead excited about meeting him and really excited. I would have been 26 years old in 2002. Uh, yeah, and it was all 25. And uh, yeah, it was really exciting. Wow. Wow. Great. And, and then I met Steve McMahon for real. And the excitement it's amazing more. how you were third, <laughs> third choice, Steve. Because because I'll be honest with you, you know you were you know my dad used to you know my dad bless me he's not here anymore but you know he used to get the Gazette religiously and he just used to love you know your your match reports you know he really did honestly he used to talk about you know what you'd said and, and me and my dad we always used to talk about football anyway but he was always going on about the match reports and you used to love his match reports yeah well, definitely i love that you I, I mean i've recently inherited a load of scrapbooks actually with all uh, you know all your gazette articles in them you know well it's not just use, use it's not just you specific it's, it's you know it's going dating back before and dating after as well but reading through Everyone. them all again um it's wonderful to read and then you really set the scene you like really paint the picture with your words of you know reading things like uh, Bournemouth the one time there was alpaca on the pitch and you cover things like that and you know what's in the news and what what the journey was like and it, it was lovely just to, to give that that whole picture and not just you know as so many often do it's just, just you know facts about the match yeah. which I think people want yeah. more than that so yeah, that, that, that was really the first the first flavor of that. Is yeah, it's very kind of that. yeah. I'm not sure it was everyone's cup of tea. I used to get equal amounts of praise and uh, you know uh, abuse because uh, <laughs> you either liked what I did or you didn't. Because some people just wanted me to cut the rubbish at the start and go to the match. But I I can't sort of I think you'd go in. I was trying to keep myself enjoying it. You know what I mean? So yeah. Myself keeping myself interested, but it wasn't everyone's cup of tea. But oh, oh my dad, my dad loved him. No, loved it. Honestly, he really did. He loved to, you know, he loved Steve Canavan. It was, it was always a thing. Um, I'm just going to go to a couple of questions here because because there's one coming already. And I suppose it's topical at the moment. Uh, what are Steve's views on today's news on the European Super League from Stephen Huntley? Good evening, Stephen. So, mm. any thoughts on that? Great idea. Great idea. No, I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for someone to be brave enough to come out and say, what a great idea. But no, uh, I'm the same as you've seen Gary Neville and Gary Lineker today and 
uh, everyone else. Yeah, it's just horrible, isn't it? And it really makes me laugh, uh, or not laugh, but sort of uh, the irony of the Premier League sort of saying, oh, you know, we'll stand firm with the Football League and the FA to, to make sure this doesn't happen when, you know, it, in all honesty, it started in 1992 when the Premier League was set up because they, they wanted the big money then and it's just it steamrolls and, you, you know, you reap what you sow, really. So, um, yeah, completely, profoundly disagree with that on every single level, but it's a natural progression and, and it's a bit sort of um, rich for the Premier League to, uh, that's an apt word, for the Premier League to uh, to now say, you know, how terrible it is when they've kind of created this monster in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, but yeah, absolutely against it. It's just sickening, but uh, I don't know. I, I, well, I hope it, it will be stopped, won't it? Because there's too, too much opposition. And, and I think like, so. But they yeah. keep trying it though, don't they? See, it won't go away. They keep, you know, they keep trying it. Yeah. Uh, right. Our next question was, what was Steve McMahon like? But I've also seen in the comments uh, that might lay them as, uh, as the same thing, asking about Steve McMahon and the pinning against the wall and his experience at Euro 2004. So maybe that's, maybe, maybe that's bigger than our question. So <laughs> I'll leave uh, that one up. That must be, that must be my old mate, Mike Laven. Mike, how are you? I've not seen you for years. Um, well, if it is the same Mike Laven, we went to Euro 2004 together. This was this this would never happen now. I sort of said to my bosses at the Gazette, oh, I've got a good idea. I can go and cover the Euros. Uh, you know, if I make me well and way there, uh, will you sort of pay for me accommodation or whatever? And they let me do it. I mean, newspapers now, they just haven't got the money to do it. So I spent two weeks covering the Euros, you know, sending the odd sort of diary piece and covering the England games. And, and Mike was one of the people that stayed in a big villa with a lot of Blackpool fans. And it was... Uh, it was pretty good, but I won't tell you too many details about that trip, you know, what goes on tour and all that. Um, Steve McMahon uh, and me had a, had a, um, a, a sort of um, yeah, old relationship. Um, oh, it was, okay. I touched on it before seeing how excited I was to meet him because, you know, he's obviously a legend of the game and quite rightly yeah. so. Well, maybe legend slightly pushing it, but he's obviously a very good player and did a lot of good things on the pitch. Uh, but, yeah, very sort of um, intimidating character, a bit of a bully uh, so in the set, in the, I think the first week of the job, uh, the first game was at Oldham two Blackpool five in the LDV Van Stroll. Yeah. The year they went on to win it, um, and and yeah, and after the game, it was a great game. That someone's got that trick. Was it Richie Richie Walker? Was that the old striker? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was a great game. They played brilliant. And I remember thinking, this is brilliant. And I ran up to Steve McMahon after, sort of dead excited, uh, and said, "Hi, Steve. I'm, I've just started the Blackpool because it's great to meet you." And he kind of looked at me and went whatever and walked off kind of thing i thought oh, oh no <laughs> and then that week i did a story based on i'd sat next to a derby county scout at a home game when they, they got a join when the press box was they were building the uh must have been the the west stand wasn't it? and all the press were at the back of the south stand and the pitch was a mile away and so no one could see down the far end one of my first games they beat bournemouth four three uh, and all the goals were down the far end and we were just asking you know fans we were having to phone people up in the other end of the stadium see what had happened it was, it was a nightmare it was awful at the time they were just trying to build those new stands in north and west stands um but yeah sat next to a derby county scout told me that they were watching john hills derby were then in the premier league quite help um wrote the story but the club said nothing i went to an away game on the saturday they played reading they got beat they were awful i remember brian reed and phil barnes having a dreadful mix-up for one of the goals uh they got hammered and after the game did our interviews and I could see my man looking at me a bit sort of aggressively. I mean, he looks at everyone aggressively, to be fair, but um, particularly at me. And then he said, the interview finished, he said, can I have a word with you? And he took me down the tunnel in the Majedski Stadium and took me in a little boot room, just me and him. And as soon as he shut the door, went absolutely ballistic, uh, told me in no uncertain terms what he thought. I mean, he'd ever printed a story like that again in relation to the John Hills to Derby story. You know, just exactly what he'd do with me. Um, wow. <laughs> Used, used a lot of words my mother wouldn't approve of, and um, basically, oh I always say that was the high point of our relationship. It kind of went. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was all right. You know, I, I, I blame myself though because I was quite young. My first job as a football writer, or the, the main football writer, and I could, unless you stood up to sort of someone like my man, you were gonna sink. And I never really stood up to him. I was a bit intimidated by him. Now I bloody tell him to. You know, and I'd, uh, yes, I'd, I'd of course, yeah, you all the lies, and I won't be spoken to like that anymore. Um, you know, you treat people decently, hopefully. Um, so <sighs> yeah, he, he was, he was okay. He, he was, he was what he was. Um, yeah, we never got on, and um, yeah, there's quite a lot of stories, but I can't really tell most of them. I'm afraid. I'll save them for my book. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, okay. I will say, I will say, right, he got on playing some great football. I mean, there's some lovely football, but but due to perhaps, you know. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not putting maximum effort in off the pitch from that 
point of view, from the management point of view, maybe that's why often you got to the midway point in the season of doing really well, playing great, and it would slide away towards the end. And I think that perhaps was a reflection of the way it was kind of run. So although they were playing great football, there was probably a reason why they never got promoted out of League One at that point. Mm, yes. We may touch on that soon. Um, question from Jane. That's your quiet question. You were asking that. Yeah, I was always a big fan of the pre-season tours. And we keep asking the players about them. We're like, oh no, you know, we don't remember anything about them. So I'm just, <laughs> so I'm hoping you'll be able to give us a little bit more. So uh, did you go on the Isle of Man tour in 2003? And any stories arising from that? I can't believe. I cannot believe that's 20 years ago almost. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I did. I loved it. We stayed in a big Hilton hotel and Douglas Promenade. Uh, I think the players were in the same place. Was that the tour where uh, there's a very I remember walking into a player's room. I can't remember if it was that tour or, or, or one a couple of years after where they were having a competition to, can I, I don't know if I can say this. Um, yeah. One of us perched on top of a wardrobe trying to um, poo into a, a glass uh, that was on the, on the floor. This was like a competition amongst the players. Um, I can't remember if it was that one one thing that I saw. That was probably the worst thing I ever saw. I quickly placed the whole retreat out of that. Um, oh, God. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't that tour. Maybe it's a different tour. I can't. Maybe I'm tiring all the players on that tour with the wrong brush. <laughs> One of them. But anyway, well, um, not name them. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. No. I wouldn't. Um, but it was. It was. It was great. They were always good. Always loved them. I, I, never. Do you know what? In ten years of covering Blackpool, I didn't have a run in with one player. Maybe just some couple of very minor things. But I always thought that was the best thing about the club. The players were really close and uh, and good lads. You know, because they didn't really have much. They weren't that highly paid or anything. Obviously not with the Oysters there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were all decent lads. Um, and the Isle of Mansour was brilliant. Yeah, we had a great time. All the tours, we had a great time. That one was, um, who did they play? Ramsey, perhaps. And um, a couple of the other places. We, we went all over with them and um, it was it was good. Um, yeah, a really lovely atmosphere. Uh, but, uh, oh yeah, we did stay in the same hotel. I remember having a, a drink with uh, Steve McMahon in the bar of the Hilton Hotel one night. Oh, me and a couple of football writers from the... Uh, Lancashire should be in Telegraph because Burnley must have been taking part as well, I think. Yeah, the way um, we played them, yeah. yeah it was like yeah. a competition, wasn't it? It was more, yeah. more sort of a, like a trophy. Yeah, the it? Steam Packet something. That's, yeah. Oh, that's right, the Alamon Steam Packet. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We got free free transport across. Um, great, I was a bonus. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, and and the Burnley writer saying to me, isn't Steve McMahon a lovely fella after, he did, after having a drink with him? And I was just saying, mm. <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> every single day. Um but you know, I'm sort of being a bit critical of my man there. He, he was okay. He did what he had to do, and, and like I said, I do I do blame myself for not standing up to him more. Um, the weirdest thing was the, the weirdest thing was the day McMahon probably might be pre moving on a bit, but the day McMahon resigned, he, yes. he rang up the Gazette office and and said he has to speak to me, and I thought I was going to get the usual kind of uh, ear bashing, and he just said, I just can I just say I want you to uh, I want to just say to the fans, can you pass on to the fans thanks for the support and and, and thanks for your support. And I remember thinking there's a really weird phone call because. He was sort of thanking me, and and he'd done nothing but kind of have a pop at me really for four years. So uh, <laughs> it was very, very strange. But anyway, I'm sure you'll get to get to the end of that, Rain. Perhaps. Yes. Um, right. In before we do get to the end of that, uh, in 034, we won the LDV at Cardiff against Southend. Did you remember? Was uh, have you got any interesting or funny memories of that day? You know, just as life as a journalist, how, how was your day on that? Did you go with the team or did you travel down on your own or how, how did it how did it sort of pan was, out? Was, that, was that the time that tommy yashin got food poisoning for a scrambled egg and the white <laughs> team now was that was that another day tommy he never, mentioned, he never mentioned it did he, <laughs> didn't, <laughs> he didn't mention it <laughs> tommy had a scrambled egg in the hotel oh was that was that to, did they play in cardiff too? was that in cardiff yes in yeah. cardiff yes yes and it would have been they were twice at cardiff but you obviously yeah, came, cambridge. came cambridge yeah, yeah they played cambridge before you like started that, that was 2000 was it was it 2000 no what, um, one, 2002 one 2004 wasn't it i think i, I think i went to both of them assuredly because they, they beat cambridge comfortably didn't they for john hill score maybe or four nil or was it? Can't but anyway um one of them uh, tommy ashing got a uh, food poisoning for i remember that um yeah stayed in the same hotel um the one yeah i can't remember what it's called now but um my memory of that as a football writer it's funny because you you know the fans. It's a great day out for the fans. Obviously, it's a final and it's brilliant and and you love it as a reporter. But 
The downside of it is you have to do a load of work because if they win, which they, they, they did every blooming time, probably apart from West Ham eventually, um, at 2012. But uh, if you win, you have to like do these 16-page or 20-page supplements. So when all the yeah. fans and a whistle a ch- celebrating, then they go to the pub and get trolled. I'm sat in Wembley or Cardiff, uh, Millennium Stadium press up uh, room for about five hours, then back oh. to my hotel for another. So I finish about three in the morning, and it's uh, it's it's not particularly enjoyable in that way. It's great. No. You know, when you the build up, you know, uh, walk into the stadium and all the tech, what a color. I never really realized it before I covered Black, Black, but what a fantastic color tangerine was when you when see it on, on mass like that. Yeah, when it's yeah. on mass, yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it? yeah. But, uh, but actually, after the game, is not much fun for, for a journalist. You just absolutely. No. It. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, the game I enjoyed, but actually, the work was pretty, uh, pretty rotten afterwards. Yeah, I can imagine it's those big, massive, like eight-page spreads, aren't they? Where it's like page after page of all the photographs and everything, and the, you know, the, well, the whole thing. It's such a massive event, isn't it? But, you know, when, when when you win any trophy, you know, and so, right. certainly at Blackpool, you know, we hadn't had any, and then we had this wonderful time when you were here, really. Um, well, the good thing about that was they sent me down to, so one of them was South End, and they sent me to South End again, things that wouldn't happen now, and just told me to spend the weekend there and then write a piece about what South End was like. So I had, a, I had a great bloody time in the pubs Friday, Saturday night, and, I, you know, all, all paid for. Um, wow. The yeah. 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 It sounds it quite nice when you're just a lad from Berry who's never had anything. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Um, what – next question is, what were the club like – <laughs> what were the club like to work and deal with for regular meetings, updates, and point of contact, etc.? <laughs> that's, that's yeah, you're did it. you have, like, somebody who you dealt with at the club, or how did that work? Yeah, um, so when I first went, it was Graham Emerson, who's the press officer, and then it was Matt Williams, uh, who yeah. came in, uh, yeah. you probably remember. Um, yeah, um, uh, yeah, it was fine. I, I always really, I don't really spoke to Matt on this show, but I, I always really liked Matt. He was, he was, again, quite sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you sort of love him all over him, I guess, a little bit. But Matt, Matt sort of w- was great for me, cause dead helpful. You knew where you stood. If you didn't like something, he'd tell you so in no uncertain terms, but never held a grudge. And would always be there to, to help you. So it was Matt really, and, and because of the sort of real skeleton way that Blackpool was run in terms of staff, i.e., there was hardly any. Matt was kind of yes. doing everything. Actually, yeah. sort of sweeping yes. up the crews. Um, so he was actually he was probably the number two person behind Carl Oyston, really in reality. Um, yeah. You know, in running the club, he really was. He was that important to them. Um, so yeah, it was Matt really, um, and the club fine. It always depended who the manager was. Obviously, when it came, for my job, it's all it always boils down to the manager. So you know, once Steve McMahon went, I was absolutely fine. Uh, Colin Andre, uh, I'm sure you'll mention him in a bit. You know, yeah. for, for whatever happened on the pitch is another story. But but off the pitch, great. Simon Grayson is the dream to work with. Uh, in fact, a couple of my mates at Fleetwood now are saying how happy they are because they get to speak to him. Uh, Simon Grayson. Sometimes I just text him what I wanted him to say uh, for a story. And he'd say, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so I didn't even have to, it's kind of, we had this agreement where we sort of, uh, uh, you know, knew what we what we wanted to get across in the story or whatever. But um, yeah, the, it was the, man- the managers were fine. Holloway was, I got on well with Holloway. He was a slightly strange fella, but um, in some ways, in terms of, um, you know, uh, you know, quite knew what to expect, but I got him fine. So yeah, the, the club were absolutely fine. And I know we'll probably talk a lot about Carl, Carl Oyston. Again, mm. take, taking everything out of it, Kyle Oyster was a dream for a journalist because he was always available and he obviously would give you these dynamite quotes. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so although you know the fans would have a very different opinion, it's purely yeah. in journalistic terms. Yeah, um, he was okay to deal with on a, on a sort of a day to day basis. He was all yeah, right. Yeah, didn't be any wrong at all personally, but um, you know, um, so, so the club were fine, absolutely fine. I know it probably sounds weird to people, uh, and like I said, I was sort of always quite lucky. Uh, because apart from the Colin Hendry reign, they were always kind of sort of creeping upwards in a way. Um, I know they didn't get that first promotion till 07, uh, was it? Um, but, um, but, you know, they're always going sort of an upward trajectory. So I was kind of lucky, really. I didn't I didn't get any of the mess that's gone on since 2012. Yeah. It was good times, probably those 10 years. Um in history are probably, you know, the most successful time, you know, in, in modern day football, not, you know, going back to the fifties with Matthews and everything else, but actually, you know, for people that are still here and around though, those were our, you know, our glory days, really though, those, those 10 years. Um, so did you ever have any spells? Cause I think it has happened since where the, the Gazette were banned from the club for whatever reason. Did that never happen when you were there? Yeah. Yeah. It, weird things like, um, 
So uh, there was a summer, if you remember, where Wes, we didn't know where Wes Hulham was going to stay or, or yeah. go back. I can't remember what story it was now. Something to do with Livingston, wasn't it? Or a season loan. I, said, I can't remember. Yeah. But anyway, it's cut long story short, no one knew. So I went to Liverpool Airport to board a plane to go to Latvia for the pre-season tour. can't remember what year this was. Um, probably the year they got promoted, I guess, in the summer before. Uh, and in front of me at the queue checking in was was, was Wes Hulahan. And no one no one thought he was going to be on this tour. And then Simon Grace was in front of him. So I'm speaking to Simon and Wes having a conversation, you know, saying, great that you're here, Wes, blah, blah, blah. In that day's paper, in that following day's paper, I write the story, Wes Hulahan is staying at Blackpool. He's on the plane. He boarded the plane to Latvia. Oh, no. I landed, <laughs> I landed in Riga. And I get this phone call from normally the most mildest man in the world, Simon Grayson. So how could I have done this? Uh, you know, the club, a ban from the club uh, for, for writing this story. So I've, I've, the Gazette had just paid, you know, a thousand pounds, put me up in a hotel and sent me to Riga. And I may as well have stayed home because I copied every story that week off the club website. Uh, wasn't allowed to interview the manager. So it, and it's, it's this, oh. it's, I, te I teach sports journalism. That's what I do now. I teach young students how to do it. And, and I always say it's like politics out of it. You're always walking on eggshells and you, you can write a story that you think is completely, you know, not going to upset anyone and suddenly it all kicks off. And, you know, sometimes you know when you're writing a story that's a bit dodgy and you might get a bit of comeback, but some of them just absolutely take you by surprise. And that was one um, that, that readily springs to mind. Was, we were banned a couple of times as well, and I, I can't quite think why I told you before. You know, my memory is terrible. But, um, yeah, it's just st stupid. We got banned on the McMahon a couple of times as well. Uh, you often, newspaper, you often get, Banned for headlines, which is really annoying as a journalist because we don't write the headlines. We mm. write the story. someone else puts the headline on. And I remember, uh, I remember Matt Williams walking towards me once with this copy of the Gazette, waving it, saying, "What's this?" And I was banned after that. And uh, <laughs> I, I got banned by McMahon after. Well, I, I, you, might go, you might go into the McMahon stuff, but when he was obviously the resignation uh, yeah. wasn't it? Was it a story we, we wrote a very? Mm -hmm. I wrote a, a good, really good story. Then saying that he'd lie. I basically called him a liar on the back page of the Gazette because he oh. said he. He'd not gone for the Oldham job, and he had gone for the Oldham job. We knew he'd gone for the Oldham job. Basically, called him a liar, and then, as you may recall, he changed his mind on the on the resignation. And uh, yeah, I was banned quite a long time after that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's just the being a football writer. I'm afraid that was one of our questions. Actually, we got that down there. So it was, uh, can you tell us about the infamous Steve McMahon resignation? So yeah, it was when he, yeah. uh, you know, if anybody who doesn't know who's watching the stream, it's where he actually was like saying it was a big press conference where he was going to resign and he kind of walked out and then he came back in, didn't he? He knocked back on the door and he was outside and he came came walking back in saying, can I, can I? Yeah, so around. someone mentioned on Twitter uh, last night that it may have been you that opened the door to, to let him into the room on that occasion. Can you tell us about that? After what I just told you, did you think I'd open the door to Steve McMahon? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd kind of shut it again. Um, <laughs> well, uh, it definitely wasn't me. It was the most surreal, bizarre thing. So, yeah, so we, we knew he was going to go. He'd gone for, well, he thought, so the story is, he'd gone for a job at Oldham and he thought yeah. he was going to get it. And then it turned out for some reason that escapes me, he didn't end up with this job at Oldham. And basically, he then changed his mind on going from Blackpool. Uh, but, but so happened that it kind of happened during this press conference and it, it but it, the but the thing that made it most surreal if you remember uh, i'm sure it's on youtube still that they said the quote that you know they denounced his resignation carl oyson was at the top table and uh, gary hickson from radio lancashire had said is steve mcmahon still in the building and at that exact moment i'm sure it was at that it might it might be exaggerating my old mind but there's a knock at the door and, and he stood there like it was orchestrated by someone uh maybe it was i don't know um, but we were there, and I, all I remember thinking is, "Oh no, I can't believe it!" I thought he was going. I was in a great mood. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he came back, and he lasted what another three or four months, didn't he? Yeah, um, yeah he didn't stay very long after that, did he? I think it was already sort of written in the stars he was going to go. I don't. Know. Oh, that's interesting because that's that's different to what I always thought the story was. I always thought it was he, he tried to resign, and then Carl Oyston had found found something in his contract that you know he he couldn't. So I thought it was like a legal thing for why he why he I'm, retracted it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe there was something in in that, um, but um, no, I, I, that's just, that's the, that's what I recall. And then he uh, he lasted yeah. a slight incident at the Player of the Season night. Then in April, and that's what eventually sort of led to him going. Um, but um, yeah, so he was there for another few. And that that period was the worst bar none of my entire probably life, never mind journalism career. That those few weeks afterwards. Uh, having to deal with Steve McMahon because I was let back in. I was allowed to stand in the tunnel to speak to the manager, to, to listen to the other journalists ask questions, but I wasn't allowed to ask questions. Oh. <laughs> and, oh. 
someone answered him a qu- uh, answer, asked the question after the games uh, for the next week, and he just stared at me constantly. He did not look at anyone else. He just stared <laughs> like that at me because um, he, <laughs> he wanted me guts for game. So um, yeah, it was a really awkward period for me personally. Oh and, my god! And gosh. again, I'm not really you know on the off chance that Mal listens to this. We, he, there was no love lost between us, obviously. But I do blame myself. I'm not. I'm not having a pop at Steve McMahon. We just you know it was it was it was what it was. And there's millions of reporters and managers that have bad uh, relationships. But um, yeah, it was it wasn't a pleasant time. I can no. I can imagine as well with his background at Liverpool and his relationship with the press at that time probably fed into his relationship with you. I'm guessing it wasn't anything to do with you. It was just his his past experience with the press. I, I would guess. Well, what I do, well, maybe it was a little bit me. And to be fair, I probably brought this upon myself because you, you touched on my writing style at, uh, when we were talking earlier. And um, I remember getting called into his office. Uh, and he said uh, it was an it was a game where they played Luton or someone, and it was nil nil. Uh, and and I'd put I'd, I'd put something like uh, the highlight of the game was when the red arrows flew over at half time or something like that. So I get called in on the Monday, and uh, and, and I had to go into McMahon's office at the club, uh, and and he said he said I've highlighted the parts of your match report I don't like, and he held up the page, and the entire double page spread was scrawled with yellow highlighter, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and but he particularly didn't like the line about the red arrows. Um, so yeah, I probably antagonised him slightly with my with my you know. <laughs> Probably a joke during a match report, so he probably didn't like that. To be fair, so you know, if I'd been dead straight and written it straight, probably wouldn't have been uh, half the problem. So I don't blame him for not liking him in some ways. I probably, I probably wound up a bit. <laughs> Mike Latham says uh, Oldham did not realise how much the compo was and pulled out of the deal. Apparently, ah, so maybe that's so it, that's kind of a bit of both, then, isn't it? Yeah, maybe Mike's in the know, so I, I'm going to go with. Yeah. Mike. Mm. Eugene McGeever came in late and was asking you which team you used to support. Well, it's, it's Barry. We've yeah. already done that earlier yeah. on in the show. Uh, Karen McGuinness has uh, as, as popped in and says, uh, Justin, has Steve been singing yet? Uh, he must have uh, an ESL song. Have you actually come up with one yet? Not yet. No, no. It's been a long day teaching today, but I'll, uh, I might sit down, Karen. Nice to, nice to uh, hear from you, Karen. I hope you're all right. Uh, yeah, um, no, I will. I've, I've not been singing as much lately. I did it for a full year during lockdown, so I'm a bit all sung out now. I'm having a little break. Uh, yeah, in fact, one of them went really viral, didn't it, about um, well, you know, the Tory <laughs> <laughs> got you got you lots of views uh, quite controversial right uh, the next question we're going to ask you about is um what was colin hendry like i know you've kind of touched on it already what was he like because obviously for fans he, he was just a well he was one to forget wasn't he really it was a disaster reign for colin hendry as part as far as uh, as fans went but what was he what was he like fine absolutely fine i wish i could tell you differently but he was fine um he was you know, it's a pity they didn't give Simon Grayson took over and he for a couple of games after Steve McMahon went the final game of the season in 2004, I think. Um, and it's a pity they didn't give Grayson the job. I was thinking this morning, actually, that Colin Andrews was, was you know, no one complained at the time. It, we, we all thought, oh, that's, that's you know, former Scotland captain. Yeah, but you think, sure. You think about it, the few managers before that, they got some good calibre managers, didn't they? You know, from Allardyce to, I know Worthington wasn't a success, but he was sort of a name at the time. And, and then you had mm. McMahon. They were all sort of big figures and Hendry kind of continued that run. Um, and, and no one complained. I remember there being really widespread excitement about it. But unfortunately, he just wasn't up to the job. And I've spoken to him since, and it, it sort of acknowledged he didn't go to plan. And you know, you, you can't really argue against it, can you? It just just no. didn't work for whatever reason. Uh, he tried a few things. I remember he, he switched the training from Squires Gate to uh, to Livon Cricket Club, which was really nice. And he, he seemed to get things okay behind the scenes. He just he just, you know, I heard a few stories from the players, um, you know, about perhaps um, a lack of sort of um, uh, tactical awareness and, and 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 team talks and whatnot, not being sort of, you know, you know, let's sort of let's see how it goes till half time kind of thing, uh, rather than you know who you're going to market corners or whatnot. So maybe there's a bit of a problem there, but um, yeah, and he had, did he have Ian Miller with him as his sister? I think he did. They were all they were all nice people. Um, yeah, he just wasn't a master. He wasn't a master tactician, was he? I don't, I don't think he had that no. ability to change a game and read no, the game no. probably well enough. From we've no, either got it or you haven't, I suppose. So he he just didn't. Anyway, he, he wasn't so bad to deal with. I suppose he, he was nothing. Right. I suppose really after Matt Moore, anybody was was great. It's a bit of dream. <laughs> no matter how Absolutely. bad they were. <laughs> Absolutely no, I mean, and he was, and he was a genuinely nice fella, and I still see him on about uh, Island. Yeah, yeah. he lives over nice. this way. Uh, no problem with Colin at all. And it just didn't, unfortunately, it just didn't happen for him. And sometimes yeah. that happens, doesn't it? With managers, he has to click, doesn't it? And, but yeah, nice guy, no problems at all. Always treated me really well. 
Another one from Jane. You can ask this one. Yeah, the uh, the, the tours in Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, any any stories from those? Northern Ireland. Now, who just stayed in Northern Ireland? Phil Trow was around on that. I remember Phil was there. Uh, Will Watt was there. Uh, Northern Ireland was great. Of I mean, me memories a bit haste. Uh, I just remember being really impressed with Northern Ireland, and I kind of I've never really been there before. Uh, and all the sorts of you know the estates nice. where. You the Union Jack on one side. I think they played Ballymena or someone. And I remember going to the Giants Causeway and having a good day out there. Didn't really mix with the players on that one from memory. And I don't know why. The Scotland one was very was very different. I, I love that tour. We went to Colin Henry's mm. home, home town, Keith, it was called. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we were dead close to the players. My big, my big, it doesn't involve any players, but my big story from that tour was... Before one of the games, and I had a half a day to kill, and I went for some, one of my, my auntie had told me about a beautiful lock that was nearby uh, in Vanessa somewhere. I was staying in Vanessa, I think. And uh, I went to walk around. It. I thought, I've got a few spare hours. I'll go and walk around this lock. And she said it was walkable. Anyway, it was a lot bigger than I thought. And I got to the far side of this lock, and it was about 45 minutes to kick off. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to miss the game here. So I thought I started running a bit. And I got towards the end of the lock, and there was a bit where you could walk across and, and cut off going the long way round. So right. I walked. Up this up this hill, and I came down the other side, and separating me from the other bank was about about ten meters of water, uh, and I was so late I could I, I didn't have I thought I can't go back round now, so I've got to go off. So there was no one about; it was deserted. It was getting about half six at night, so I stripped off completely naked because it was quite deep water, and I had to go straight to the mat. So I needed my clothes right, and so I held my clothes above me in my head. <laughs> Water. And as I came out of the water, it went over a little rise, and I got to the top of this rise, and there was a couple, the couple <laughs> sat there having a picnic, and I, <laughs> beautifully British scenes where I went all right, and they went all right, and and, and I, <laughs> I walked, and I, I die in embarrassment, and then put my my kex on around the corner, and uh, and then ran all the way back to town, just made it. Oh, you know, I loved that. I loved it. It was great. I just, I just, because I love the outdoors and I love what I go walking in the lakes every week. And I just went walking and that, you know, it was, I, yeah. it was many moments where you think, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this job. Uh, and, it, and it was good. Uh, I don't think they were, I can't remember. They, I remember they played, there was a dreadful game in Inverness. I think they lost one nil or it was nil nil. It was all sort of pretty uninspiring, which kind of set the tone then for the season that followed. Uh, yeah. Because when did Hendry go? Would it have been about November, perhaps? Um, yeah, I think, it was. I think so, he yeah. was asked to resign a bit sooner than that, wasn't he? And and stuck it out um, for about a month. Yeah, was it, was it Gardner leave? I can't remember what happened. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, there's yeah, uh, there was a lot of. Oh, that's right. But yeah, some story started to come out, didn't they, about how he was paying for the bottle of water for the players and the sandwiches, and that's right. And oh yes, yes, of course, yes. Yeah. Appreciate that, and it kind of yeah, you're probably right, Jane. It probably sort of festered for a while, didn't it, before it was uh, before it was yeah. sold. Yeah, but yeah, it was. Um, it, it, you know, results wise, it was the right thing, obviously, to do. Yeah, yeah right. Good question for another one from Jane. Go on, then you ask him that one as well. Yeah, Latvia in two thousand and seven. I obviously remember seeing you in Latvia, and uh, we went to uh, to Ventspils, which was absolutely idyllic place with these white beaches and bright sunshine, and nothing to do there really apart from drink. And 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 we ended up uh, playing the locals at a football match on the beach, and you were the referee. Do you remember that? Yeah, and I was furious because I would have played because uh, I love playing football, but I'd broken my leg in that January um, because I always oh. – I, I, in fact, I came back from that uh, broken leg the very day Blackpool began their 10-match um, unbeaten run to get promoted. And I always said to Simon Grace, nothing to do with you. It's me being back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I did referee it. I was still sort of – my leg wasn't healed. Um, it was brilliant, wasn't it, that, Jane? I remember yeah. that really well. Uh, yeah, uh, that was that was the other thing. The fans are really nice. You know, the fans like yourself who, who sort of properly followed the club, and not that I don't mean properly followed. Everyone's can follow them in whatever way they like, but you know, the ones yeah, that the ones that go on tours, are, yeah, so and it's pretty die hard, yeah, aren't they? You see them in the bars and you have a drink and a chat. I always like that side of it. And the beach game was brilliant. Yeah, again, it's not, again for me. I was getting paid to do that, and you're just thinking, wow. Um, oh, so wow. yeah, absolutely lovely. Yeah, that was really nice. Yeah, there was there was that was probably the same year where where we were invited to Valerie Bellicon's house. And um, for some reason, I couldn't go, and I can't remember why. And anyway, when they came back, so this is sort of members of the local media and the press officers of Blackpool, they were telling me about how they'd, they'd had to sort of strip. A lot of my stories involve nakedness. Why is it? <laughs> uh, uh, but, yeah, they sort of had a light, a sort of 
a, a massage which involves sort of hitting them with a branch while they're around Valerie Bellicon's private pool. It was the weirdest story. And I kind of regretted not going for years just so I could have told the story. But uh, as it was, I wasn't there. Oh, uh, what a shame. <laughs> what a shame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you actually went, ended up going to, didn't you? To oh, I went to, yeah, the, the first year we went, went to... Um, he used to have a brewery, didn't he? Kimmel Brewery. And there was, I think there were 13 of us at the first match we played. It's sort of very yeah. outer Riga. And um, we took a taxi out there and, it, you know, the taxi drivers were actually waiting for us at the game. It was that far out rather than coming to get us again afterwards. And, uh, yeah, we just, we've been begging, like, before we went over to Latvia, we're like, please, you know, can we have a tour of your brewery? And then it, they just decided on the day, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take you. So we had to send our taxi drivers off back without us. Um, and uh went in this big people carrier just taken off by this you know big guy with you know shades and a suit and a gun probably <laughs> and we're like, we probably shouldn't be doing this really because they could be taking us anywhere we're seeing like signs yeah. for estonia and we're like, well, what's happening here? <laughs> well, we i had a lot of moments like that on that tour where you're thinking i could die at any minute here. i don't know yeah. who uh, yeah, and then yeah. two things from that. I remember going there. I also remember going to Valerie Bellicon's private his his head his office at the bank that he ran in Riga, Central Riga. An unbelievably luxurious office with beautiful fittings. And there's like a picture of uh, Prince Charles signed to Valerie. I'm not not that might be not true. There's a picture of the royal family, and I can't remember whether it was signed or not. But you know the beautiful leather settee. I mean, smell of money. It was it was amazing. And also we went on his his yacht. He had a super yacht. Uh, which you oh. went down that main river in Riga, I can't remember what it's called. And again, this isn't a pleasant story again, but me, I remember being absolutely mortified because uh, there, was this, there was this buffet on this this yacht. It was beautiful, you know, prawn and lobster. And uh, we all, um, Oyster was there and Simon Grayson and, and um, other members of the media, etc. And I got a bit of stomachache off one of the prawns uh, and so went to use the toilet on this super yacht and then it wouldn't flush. Um, oh, yeah. And so I put the seat down thinking, oh, no. And I came out of the toilets and bloody, bloody, Valerie Bellicom was waiting to use the toilet. I, <laughs> again, I, I always seem to put my foot in it in some way. <laughs> yeah, oh, but, no, that's so yeah. fast. Yeah. Oh, right. Just, okay. Maybe what, swiftly on. <laughs> what were deadline days like as a journalist and how open were the club with you? Because obviously as fans, they were so stressful because they used to lose the fax machine and all the rest of it. So just wonder what it was like for you as a journalist on deadline day, transfer deadline day. Well, horrible number one because um, because you you know you you just waiting really and, and you know you get a snip of something, but the club never uh, confirmed anything. They might give you if it got late at night and you were going to do something to tip you off so you could get your story ready. But I was kind of lucky in the way that um, because I'm so old, it was the days before you know the rolling blogs, the twenty you know the, the transfer. You know, poor journalists these days have to sit there for twelve hours and, and type about nothing. Because uh, you know, especially if you're covering Blackpool, you know, for, you know, there's maybe a couple of signings on a good year. Um, but I, you know, it was it was just it was boring more than anything. Deadline days and the club weren't very open, particularly. Uh, they give you a little tip off here and there, but you know, quite rightly so, they kind of wanted to keep it to keep it private. Um, they sort of gave you they gave, they gave me tip offs, but I wasn't allowed to. Uh, you know, you have an agreement, and you sort of say, "Well, I'll hang on to that." And you know, the, the club wanted to break it first. The club, the balance has shifted by then. So you know, in the late nineties. You know the the newspaper held the power. You know the, there was no press offices, there was no club websites, so the newspaper was the source, and the club, you know, used the newspaper to get that news out. But then the balance of power shifted to the club in the two thousands because every club got press offices and websites, and they no longer needed the press because they could break the story themselves and drive the traffic to their own site. So quite naturally, why would they give the local paper the story? So uh, you know, you kind of ran it. They, they broke it, you'd, and then you'd maybe run it a minute later or something, or or you you know you were given an interview that no one else had got because I. Was gotten well with them they maybe just gave me things that, that they didn't give to the press um so i kind of got an exclusive in some way but you very rarely broke a story um you know oh. that the most nervous of everything in fact was when i got wind someone told me i can't remember as a director or something told me that uh, colin hendry was being sacked and we ran the story in the next day's paper the front page colin hendry to be sacked today and i, and I remember um I, and it, it didn't happen till about six o'clock at night and i remember i went to bed at three o'clock afternoon because it felt so sick because if you had been sacked you know what a rubbish piece of journalism that would have been i mean it would have been 
you don't know what you're talking about, which I often got. Uh, and and it was, <laughs> oh, so this was a journey. You kind of you have to state your reputation a bit on certain things, but that, that turned out to be right because he was. But all through the day, you know, my boss at the because yeah. everything he shows going to be sat. We've got this in our front page. If he isn't, we're going to look stupid. And but thankfully, thankfully for me, you know, for Colin, uh, he was in the end. But um, yeah, uh, there we go. <laughs> nervous times right next question this is one from jane again what are the best and worst grounds that you've been to is it i, I would imagine for f- facilities and be able to see the game and all that sort of stuff so best and yeah. worst we'd say for a well, I to go two, to. two favorite grounds are, are barnsley and chesterfield the old chesterfield uh, and i don't oh. know why. i love barnsley i just think the people are so free. you know they all call the even the male stewards call you love which i think is fantastic um, <laughs> I love they got the, the I don't think they've got them now. They had outdoor toilets. So if you're doing in the gentleman's urinal, you know, the snow would be falling down. Everyone was so friendly. The press box was great. Uh, they came out the tunnel to the far side, didn't they? Where, where the away supporters were. And then the press box was directly above the, the centre. But everyone was so friendly. And Chesterfield, uh, I love because they uh, always gave you a glass of red wine or whiskey at half time. Uh, and it was so small, the press box was tiny. I've never, it's like it was designed for Ronnie Corbett. It was it was the, the smallest press box. And I also had uh, one of my best moments there, or, or least professional moments in that. Uh, does, it's not a bad story. This is no nakedness. Or, oh, or, I was going to say, I was worried what you were going to say <laughs> then. We are starting to panic in the <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I don't know where it's all right. We're only laughing we're about it in that way. But yeah, it was New it was New Year's Day, and I went out on New Year's Day with some New Year's Eve with some friends, drank too much, and basically got out of bed at about one twenty the next day, and suddenly thought, "Oh my God, I should be at Chesterfield," and and drove at the speed of light to Chesterfield. And I arrived at twenty five past three, and I was doing the summarising on Radio Lanks. So Ian Pory and Chisnell. I had to sit there for 25 minutes saying, we think Steve Canavan, we think he's on his way. He might be here. And I was just and dashed in, sweating, dashed into this press box. It's Chesterfield, so I'm to leave myself into the seat. And then he very smoothly said, and Steve's joined us at 27 minutes past three. And uh, I just carried on with my commentary, but I uh, did feel that thankfully nothing had happened. But um, And they still paid me, which was great. Um, but yeah, it's Chesterfield, I just don't know why. I've always said, and I always preferred the lower league clubs, even, you know, as nice as Arsenal and the four-course meal, were and Man City on New Year's Day. I remember playing them in the Premier League. I think it was New Year's Day. Amazing, you know, unbelievable facilities for the press. But I, I, I much preferred because you know the, the Premier League was great, particularly for the fans. But actually, yeah. for journalists and the access, journalism is telling stories and it's about access and being able to tell those stories. And mm-hmm. you know, you have to you have to ask permission to sort of stand up at some Premier League grounds. Whereas in the lower league clubs, you could waltz, you know, go around the pitch or kind of help yourself and do whatever. And and and, and the people are much more friendly. You know, it's it's, it's yeah. slightly slightly more ramshackle and, and i'm a kind of ramshackle person anyway and, and it just much more appeals to me so um th- those are my two favorite grounds worst ground um oh i'll tell you what the worst ground is and it's just it, only because it, it uh, annoyed me um it's not really the worst ground but Notts county annoyed me because it's actually a really nice ground but uh they them and huddersfield are the only press boxes in the entire football league as far as i'm aware uh, including premier league as well that insist on you wearing a suit and tie uh in the press box which, if anyone who knows me will tell you, I, apart from my father's funeral, I don't think I've ever worn a suit and a tie. Um, so I um, had a run stand up row with someone in Notts County, who, who was sort of bottom of Division Four, by the way, or League, or league Three, uh, and, uh, telling me that I couldn't go in. And 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 you had to walk. The reason was you had to walk through the directors' area to get to the press box. Um, and I was sort of, I was at Huddersfield, one or two. But, but I remember having a, it's, I can't, you know, I couldn't believe it because it's to me that sort of snobbishness. I hate any sort of thing like that. And there is an argument to say you should be really smart, but. You know, I've never quite understood it. So, on a personal, purely um, selfish uh, reason, I, that that annoyed me at Notts County, uh, and also because we always seem to play. This is going back to two thousand two, three, four. We always seem to play Notts County away in April on Grand National Day, yes. uh, which is really annoying. It, did you remember that? And yeah, it was dead, yeah, yeah. You never get a bet on. Or you sort of couldn't listen to the race, and it, it just. I don't know. So me and not counting. <laughs> I was just thinking about you and Chesterfield and being late. And I remember we we went to Chesterfield for uh, for a night match and we were late. And it's such a it's, it's such a hard drive across that, like you know, through the hills, like to Chesterfield, isn't it? It's a really mm. difficult road, and uh, and and we got lost, and we actually arrived at the turnstiles uh, and my dad almost had a row because the guy was saying you're already one nil down or something and we hadn't even got in the game he was giving us a stick on on the gate and my dad was going furious about it <laughs> said but he wasn't happy about it no. uh, but yeah so it's not i can understand why why you were late um <laughs> um best worst players to interview mm. um 
I never really, I never really had a bad interview really. Marlon Harewood, I remember, was a bit uh, just didn't want to speak and um, sort of, uh, yeah, it was a bit funny. But apart from that, there was really no one, uh, no one I didn't like interviewing. Best player without doubt is Keith Southern. I don't know if you've had him on this on the show, but uh, what? No, 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 not yet. But we'd like to. Oh, he's, he's such a just a genuinely decent human being, and also can can we'll we'll talk about it. And you know, if ever Blackpool got beat, and you know. It's a weird thing in football whereby, you know, you get beat, no one wants to talk because if they're too depressed, any player would talk. It's the press officers who don't want them to talk. Um, but Keith Sun was always kind of wheeled out because he knew he'd say a lot. And was sometimes it was controversial. He was cheesed off about something, but mainly was, you know, sort of say pair of hands, really. Um, I love to interview Richie Wellham because he's he literally said whatever he was thinking, uh, which was brilliant. <laughs> I really, I really like Richie. And I, uh, <laughs> so, Charles, give us an example of something he was thinking. Oh, <laughs> Can you think of anything? Yeah. And he once went berserk in me because I only gave him six out of ten for a, for a match where he set up three goals. But I genuinely thought he had an average game. Uh, but with hindsight, maybe he was right on that one. Um, <laughs> no, it just just sort of just said, you know, if he, if he thought they played crap, he said we played crap. Or if he, if he thought the manager got it wrong, he'd say it, which no other player does normally. Uh, and he was just, you know, gave an honest and wound people up, and it, it was just good for a journalist, you know. Uh, but also, I, I absolutely loved. I'm serious. No, I love. He's one of my favourite all time players. I loved watching Richie Wellens. I thought his passing, he just. He just played the game. I loved the games the way I love it to be played, and I thought he was a great little midfielder. I know he, he sort of—I don't know what you think of Richie because I know he sort of had lovers and haters. Fell out with us, fans. didn't he? We, we, he, uh, he? I can't remember what it was. He gave some abuse, didn't he, to the fans when he came back, and I don't think they ever liked him. I, I, yeah. I, I never liked him because I blame him for getting us relegated oh. at Oldham. Uh, he got sent off, and I think we were winning at the time, and and we ended up getting relegated basically because he got sent off so I never forgave him for that and I think he, he got sent off probably I was looking back actually through all the reports he must have got sent off about half a dozen times for Blackpool so it was a thing yeah. Hmm. so well, yeah really I mean that so well, when, I when, I, when I decide I don't like a player that's kind of it for me so. well you were kind of uh, funny enough uh, we had Tommy Yashin on and, and 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 Tommy actually blames himself for getting nutmegged uh, for he, the so goal at Oldham, yeah. And I said it wasn't you, goal. it was Wellens. <laughs> so he's always, we never blamed he's always blamed himself, Tommy Yashin. But so I think we gave <laughs> him some, some, rele some release uh, because uh, Jane's always blamed Wellens for getting sent off. So uh, was that before I, was that the late 90s? It, it would be before you came. Yeah, yeah. It was it, it, it yeah. was obviously we got promoted back up from that. Yeah, it's when McMahon first came. I think it was yeah. his first season we got relegated. And then yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what you said there about falling out of Wellens because he gave a bit of jip to the fans. But th that's exactly right. That's exactly what he would do. But I, as a journalist, and I can't mm. have my because you've got to remember, footballers are so sanitised and so you know taught how to speak to the media and don't want to cause mm. any trouble. I actually think it's whether you upset a few people or not, it's actually quite refreshing to get someone who's brave. Yeah. To um, actually speak the mind. Yeah, it so rarely happens. It's actually quite nice when you get a player like that. You know, yeah. all right, you might have a few people, but at least he's actually given an opinion. Yeah, because mm. you know they're just going to churn out the same exactly, spe yeah. spiel that you know. Well, they don't even speak these days. I mean, no. we, don't, we don't see apart from like the, the official club interviews. We don't, you know, see anything that our players say. So we don't really know anything about them because we don't get that that personality side of them these days. Yeah, it's very it's, it's very strange at the moment at the club. You don't really get to any, any of that. Um, yeah. Should we ask that that one? Because so we've of, covered that. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what was your Saturday match day routine? Well, you know really, routine? really boring story. I, I um, got uh, up, had a shower if I felt like it. Um, you know, um, um, you you tended to. Did you really have to do things. certain things? You know, certain certain things be, have, have to be in place, or did you, did you just kind of do it on the spur? No, spur? Uh, um, you, well, you had to apply for your sort of access for tickets and the company called Dataco and all that sort of thing. No, very much just get to the game about half one. I like to get there fairly early and have a sort of wander around, talk to the talk, talk to the players a little bit as they're warming up or talk to, I don't know if you've heard of a fella called Keith Graham, who uh, is the or who was the steward at uh, Blackpool Football Club, legendary amongst the press people. He was a steward at Bloomfield Road. He was uh, about 70 years old and uh, a real eccentric character um he was great and actually you'd always make your cup of tea from the tea urn and I, I like i like watching the reaction of the opposition journalists as well particularly in the premier league when they came to bloomfield road and you know they got this moldy not moldy but very sort of stale club sandwich that's obviously been there in the middle of the day and the left over clearly uh, and then a tea urn with some lukewarm tea you know and you come from man this is like man city where you get a four-course meal <laughs> uh, and fruit and stuff um so, uh, 
<laughs> well, Matt, yeah, just got there early. Always did a bit of, believe it or not, did a bit of prep and looked at, you know, you look at, as a journalist, you always check out who the opposition top scorers are and what the head to head records are and all the sort of basics of being a football writer. Um, but like to relax, really. I never like to be in a rush because, you know, um, you know, you saw the other thing is just press boxes are often quite narrow and, and everyone glares at anyone who comes in quite late and you have to shuffle along and stand up and let them go past. And I was often doing the radio, used to love doing the radio with Ian Chisnell, the, the, the summarising, because it made me realise what a skilled job being a commentator is. Really, really difficult job and it was great for me because I just yeah. chipped in with the odd stupid remark here and there. Um, but that, I that was do it. Yeah, yeah, it is. We we actually <laughs> right. live watch alongs and we're having to commentate and it is quite yeah. stressful. But we we just are commentating and I just talk about the haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much I work with Neil Lanks, to be fair. It um, is a skilled job. It definitely it really is. is. It's, it's the best commentators are, uh, and there's some really good people like early on, Gary Flintoff, who's now the England producer for Five Live. He, he did a lot of commentary for Lanks in it when I first started. And um, Richard Connolly, who I went to, people, to BBC World Service, they were all at Radio Lancashire when I started. Um, so yeah, great, but no, you know, there's no real routine to speak of as such. You went and watched the game, and then the worst bit, like I say, is after. Um, I feel sorry for journalists now because they have to do you know a million and one updates on Twitter. I would have hated that, uh, and uh, yeah. lives and all that sort of stuff. I, I watched the match, interviewed the managers. So you used to go along, used to before the, the new press area was built, which they had to do because of Premier League regulations underneath the uh, East Stand. You used to walk back under the tunnel, and all the fans had had, uh, had gone. And the manager came out there and uh, look at Will Watt chipping in there. Unbelievable. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, Will, I'll get to that. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it was uh, there was no reason to sort. It was just kind of quite a nice and relaxed because uh, Will. So speaking of Will, he would have had it much worse than me because he would have had to do all his tweets uh, and all that sort of stuff. Whereas I kind of because I've been there quite a while, I was able to sort of be my own boss a little bit, and I was probably a bit sulky and refused to do stuff like that. So I was quite all right. I, I went into the managers, and then I used to write, always write my report. My routine was to have a Chinese on the Saturday and go out with a couple of mates, and then Sunday morning. From about 10 till 1 o'clock, I'd write all my stuff. My stuff had to be in by Sunday afternoon to be placed on the page for the Monday. So Sunday mornings are my kind of time to work, and I always wrote my report around those times, uh, which you wouldn't get away with now because uh, there's an on-the-whistle report, and then the next day and there's a third one and all that sort of thing. Um, so there you go. I remember being sat at a motorway junction for two hours on New Year's Day waiting for Steve. I don't remember. That could be the Chesterfield story. It could be any story. That Will, <laughs> Will, I, yeah, I apologise, Will. Uh, he's, got four, he's got form for it, Will. We've already found that out. Yeah. Yeah, um, so what, what, what were Tuesday night matches like then? Did you have to get all your report done straight after the match? What was your deadline for those? Uh, for the Tuesday matches, mm. uh, uh, yeah, they were all oh, so in the so when I first started, you, you know, this was before Wi-Fi. Uh, you used to have to dial sort of in your first of all, you had to phone it through to the copy takers at seven a.m. the next morning. So then you had to plug a, 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 not a modem, what they called you had to plug something into your phone line to send it through. You wrote on your laptop. It was a, it took ages. So what I remember staying like at a fax, I, I suppose. Would it be like a fax? No, a dongle, was it? Yeah, that's right. Like that yeah. kind of thing. Sort of pre-Wi-Fi. <laughs> uh, but it was so hit and miss. So I remember going to Luton once and it not working. And I was I was booked into a travel lodge or something. And I had to drive home at 2 a.m., got home at five in the morning after writing my report because it wouldn't send. Then I had to go to my mum and dad's house and 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 put it, plug this oh. thing into the online and send. It, it, honestly, it was like a, a different age. Um, but but Tuesday nights, yeah, same sort of routine really, other than you know, a late late finishes, a lot of late finishes, which is why I one of the reasons why I eventually stopped because I was just knackered. Um, because it is, I definitely think it's held like a young man's game, really, in a lot of ways. You do a lot of driving around the country, a lot of late nights. Um, and it's great, and I still even miss it occasionally now, to be honest. But um, you know, because you never really feel like you're properly working. But um, but yeah, it, it, it was quite tough in some ways. Uh, but then again, I used, to get, I used to get every Friday off work as well, which was which was lovely uh, ahead of the Saturday match. So yeah, it was yeah. Sweet Will saying, has, uh, have you mentioned uh, the second trip to Latvia and the Wes Hulan story, which yes, you have? So have. we'll have to get Will Watt in. It, it, definitely. <laughs> no, Will's got some fails, I'll tell you that. We'll, we'll, have, to, we'll, we'll have to get you in. If you're available, Will, definitely get in touch with us. Uh, Ian Barron is just saying, have you ever been to Feetham's or the Darlington Arena? Did, did you ever go there? He's a Darlington fan. He always, he always needs, needs to know. Um, we had a pre-season game there once, didn't we? Yeah, I've definitely been. I've definitely been. And I can't, I can't remember anything about it, I'm sure. I do remember going to Hartlepool and walking around Hartlepool and thinking it looked it possibly the, the worst place I've ever seen. Um, but I think I might have just called it on a bad day. Hartlepool no. Centre. No, you oh, didn't. Really? No, yeah. <laughs> I've been several times. And it's also the coldest place I've ever been it as well. Is. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, but yeah, I did go to Darlington, uh, but, I, but I can't remember anything about it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, Amy. We don't know anything. Uh, what was Larry like as a player, and did he change as a manager? Was he different? Did, did you kind of meet him as a as, as a player and a manager? Yeah, yeah. Um, he didn't really. No, um, he was he was a lovely fella. Um, a little bit. Um, what's the word? But there are the, even the players were scared of Steve McMahon. So I remember him and Mike Flynn, who was a lovely guy, uh, talking to me. They were like the two elder statesmen of the team, and they were talking to me in the sponsors' lounge upstairs ahead of something. We were on a good natter, and then Steve McMahon walked in the room at the other side, and they literally ran away from me because they weren't allowed to. Or they shouldn't uh-huh. be speeding, you, you know. And it, and it, so oh, no. it'd be nice if you had a bit of backbone and say, "Well, sod the manager." But obviously, you're not going to do that. You got your follow your manager's orders. But uh, but Laddie was yeah, really nice guy. Um, He's where I teach now. He's done a load of stuff with the students for me, and I get him on Zoom, and I still we still speak. Um, yeah, lovely guy. And did he change? Um, I suppose a little bit in that you always change because you have to separate yourselves from the players, etc. But but I, we always got on really well because I was uh, I'd known him previously, and I really supported him. I wanted him to get the job because I, I don't know. I had a feeling he'd, he'd be good at it somehow. I don't know why. Um, mm. And also because he did well. I remember I thought they'd blown it. I think it was after he take, took over from Hendry, they played, he, he sort of started not brilliantly. And I think they got beat at Carlisle. And um, I remember thinking, oh, he's probably blown that now. But he, but he, he got the job anyway. And, and obviously, as history uh, tells, th- uh, thank goodness he did. But yeah, no, nice guy. Never really changed. But despite the fact he banned me over that Wes Houlihan thing, I, I yeah. get the feeling that was probably that was probably done you know, by other people at the club rather than Simon himself. Uh, and yeah. even when we were banned, I remember me and may, maybe it was me and Will perhaps having a game of pool with uh, him and Steve Thompson in, in, a, in a, on that Latvia tour and it being absolutely fine. And we were kind of joking about the fact I'd been banned. Uh, so, nah, it was fine. I've so got a lot of time for Simon Grace and I think he's a really, really nice guy. Good. Jane still has nightmares about him on his second time round. But oh, we don't talk about, <laughs> we're not, not talk about we're not that. Talk. First time round, he was brilliant. Um, yeah. So can you tell us uh, memories of the perfect 10, the Oldham semi-finals, and uh, Yeovil at Wembley? Have you got any sort of, you know, what was it like? As, you know, I suppose we as fans know what it was like, but, you know, you're following this story, and it, it was just right in itself, I suppose. It was an amazing – the whole yeah. thing was incredible, wasn't it? So. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, I broke my leg on in January the 2nd. In fact, Will, I came on as a sub for Will Watt in this game. We were playing five-a-side football in Blackpool, and he said to me, just watch yourself. They're a bit tasty, this lot. And I was sort of, oh, whatever. And I, I, nut, like, I nutmegged the fella, and then he just whacked me, and I broke my leg in two. So uh, I think I went back to work in the March or the start of April. I can't remember. And it was the first game. I think they beat crew, actually. Uh, it was the first game back was my was my return. So I was I was the catalyst for the 10-game run. Um, so it was great. You just knew. You knew they were going to go up. You knew it was going to carry on. Um, the closest... Mm. The, Closest game was at Cheltenham, I think, where I think they won 2 1. And then the key Southern scoring uh, from a rebound. Um, was that the that one was... where Joe Hart pulled off about three wonder saves, didn't he? Was, was that Cheltenham yeah. away where, where he, he pulled off some incredible saves? He, he, yeah, he, probably, yeah. A die full length and flick one up, it hit the bar, bar and came out. Yeah. It, it was unbelievable. I remember seeing yeah, the video of that. I remember that being the closest they came to, you know, not winning. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it probably was that game. And then that was the Swansea game, wasn't it? The final game. Yeah. Um, which was just amazing. Probably my favourite Blackpool game out of anything I've watched. I just that, was it six three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, Keegan Parker four yeah. or two. Andy Morell two. Andy Morell got. I think Andy Morell got four, didn't he? Andy Morell yeah. got four. Yeah. And yeah. one of the goals was that beautiful kind of volley uh, lob. Do you remember that? It was like a first time volley lob. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. From the long kick. Was it from the long yeah, kick? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What a yeah. goal that was. Uh, yeah, Joe Hart saving a penalty. It, yeah, it was. It was just brilliant. Um, Absolutely amazing. Yeah, and you knew. And then Oldham semi-finals, they kind of looked in control. I remember them winning at Oldham 2-1, I think, where Sula might have scored. Um, yeah, he, he went yeah. round the keeper and that, and, and the two yeah. defenders collided, right. didn't they, and fell over each other for Wes's. Yeah, you probably remember. And then you get to Wembley and you're thinking, oh, God, that you know, this because everyone was like typical Blackpool, they're going to muck it up. You know, after, after this brilliant run, they're going to muck it up. But it just never looked like losing, really. It was, it was, it was kind of straightforward. Um, yeah. And a uh, great goal from Keegan, wasn't it? Was that the, the yeah. big... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a free kick from Robbie Williams just before half time, and then yeah, King. Yeah. Blimey, look nothing like. <laughs> um, yeah, it was great. It just you know excitement, really thrilling time, and it, you know it's great after all those years of kind of nothingness, really. You know because they never quite did it under McMahon. They, they had a couple of LDVs and then that Hendry era, and it, and it just it felt like they deserved it, you know, because uh, I'd got by that point I'd been there five years and got to know a load of fans. 
Uh, and you kind of heard this backstory of how you know this once sort of great club uh, and had suffered years of disappointment since the since the what start of the 80s really wasn't it mm. um, and it just felt like it, it was deserved and the time was right and you know that Bradford game when they printed the details to Wembley in the program yeah. that's being told all the time and uh fresh in the memories and it just felt great that they'd actually done it and then to do it in that manner you know, 10 games in a row. And then to have Simon Grace in charge, who, who I really liked. For me as a journalist, it was it was brilliant. It, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Did you find there was a leap in quality um, in the facilities when you went up into the championship? You, you know, do you find there was a... What, a black club? No, uh, well, the, all the clubs, all really. The clubs, obviously. You know, you know, the difference <laughs> between going to all the, you know, the lower your, division your teams. And, you, and, your and then you move up to the championship. Oh. Or, Did, I think they played Norwich away in the first game. Is that right? I think they played Norwich. Leicester. And, Leicester. Oh, yeah, Leicester. Yeah, they won one nil, didn't they? Because yeah. um, Wes yeah. Ulam played, didn't he? That was that must have been yeah. the year. Where it was, yeah. yeah, that's the year where they didn't know if he was going to stay. And well, uh, yeah, the, the the thing at the airport when we got banned. Um, yeah, uh, and um, and Leicester. You obviously, yes. The answer is yes to the question because you go to Leicester and what a lovely stadium that is. And straight away you're yeah. thinking, blimey, you know, as much as I love Chesterfield, this is a bit of a step up. Um, yeah. So yeah, it did. I mean, not every ground was like that. You still got the old slightly slightly uh, crummy one. But yeah, you you did notice a step up actually. Uh, you know, there's some good good teams in that in that division then, wasn't there? Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. Good, and it and it felt good and and you know it was helped by the fact they did they did pretty well. They, they, I can't remember where they finished that season. They were, they were clinging on a little bit with it towards the end. I can't really remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, they just stayed up, didn't they? They just stayed up. If I remember rightly, was there not like a combination? It was was that the year I used to put daft bets on. There was a bet where I had to bet all these different bets. And I would have won about two thousand pounds. And it, if it, we it, had got relegated, it, it, it was the combination. Yeah. It, it was this incredible combination where we had to lose. Somebody had, you know, and all this sort of thing. I had to come and I bet every single combination. I only put about, you know, five pound each, but I still to win thousands. And I knew I'd never win. You know, I knew yeah. if I bet all these bets, it was never going to happen. I thought I'll make sure. Yeah, we so stay it must up. have come down to the last. game. Yeah, it did. Really. It came down to the very last game of the season. Yeah, and we had. I can't I, I'd thrown bets on to make sure we didn't go yeah. go go down because um, I was hey, going to win. I remember it being. A, I don't think it was a very um, you know enjoyable season in terms of the football it, from memory. I think I think you know it's quite four four two. So Grayson had taken them up, and they did, but they're obviously not the same force in that next division. And yeah, yeah. I, remember, I remember it not being brilliant on the pitch or not as enjoyable after the thrilling season before. But you know the fact they stayed in that division was just a result in itself, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like his sticking patch, Grayson, wasn't it? Where he could, you know, and it, it, it proved years later, wherever he went, he could get clubs out of the, you know, into the championship. But he, but that was his level one. He couldn't get, he couldn't move them up into the Premier League. And I think that because he was saying, I mean, I was looking looking back at his interviews from that time when we were in the Championship, and he was saying, look, you know, we can't expect to be winning games every week at this level. And this is what he did when he came back this time. It's like, you know, we can't be expecting to to, to win every week. And, and he was always downplaying things. And then when Ollie came in, obviously things were completely different. Like, yeah, we could do this. We're going up, and that's yeah. I think you need that extra sort of shift in in attitude to so, take yeah. it up a bit further. Yeah. Point. Sometimes, though, you know, you know, I thought Grayson did really well at Preston, and it would it would be interesting to see what. I'm sorry, I shouldn't mention that word, but you know, it'd be interesting yeah. to see what what he would have done there. I think he was, you know, he obviously went for 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 if he couldn't resist the challenge at a, a bigger club, but um, he, um, <coughs> <laughs> not on this stream, they're not a bigger club, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, are you going to be somewhere, Steve? Going mental in the comments here. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, sometimes you know that that you know on the sidelines, let's rah 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 Holloway style doesn't pay. You know, Holloway's not exactly had massive success. Um, you know, no, he so, hasn't. Yeah, so it's something. It just, I think with Holloway, sometimes a manager just fits, doesn't it? A manager just fits yeah. a club. Yeah. And with Holloway, it gloriously fitted. Uh, perhaps Blackpool as a club and the way it was run at the time just fitted what just Holloway fit. was. Uh, and I think that's the thing. Like perfect. I think it's a really good job, to be fair to him. And there's nothing wrong with sort of downplaying. That was just his style, wasn't it? Mm, and maybe, yeah. right, maybe it works to a certain point and not anymore. But I don't, I, I don't know. I thought he did a great job while he was there. Well, we're going to ask you something. He here, did. He here. did. I remember being gutted when he left Larry oh. first time around. Well, so was I. It was the day before Christmas. It ruined my bloody Christmas. I had to work on Christmas Day. Yeah, I did it, was it? It, it was sad when he went, but uh, obviously we got, um, I was just going to ask you, obviously Tony Parks and then, you know, the next question is what was Ollie like? So really I was, I was just wondering, you, you know, a lot of people said that Ollie inherited Tony Parks's team and, you know, a lot of it was down to Tony Parks, the success, but what, what was Tony Parks like? Because, because obviously he brought in Charlie, didn't he? And, he, and DJ and David and brought Brett back. 
brought Brett Brett back. Yeah. So what was he sort of the big thing behind behind that season, or do you think it was just all down to Ollie and his infectious personality and the fact that he he basically you know turned a, a lot of nobodies into somebodies, didn't he? And he made them believe that they, you know. And he also uh, he may not know this, but he made them um, s- agree to the bonus structure. Um, which we found out, didn't we? Off, uh, um, where they offered them five million, no bonuses for the whole season, so they didn't get win bonuses at all for any game. But they had this five million pound uh, carrot at the end. And yeah. when Ollie put it to the players, they were like, "You know, you're having a laugh. We're only just about staying in this division, but we're going to get a five million bonus for getting the Premier League." But he somehow <laughs> turned the players' heads, and they actually agreed to it. So they had no bonuses, and they had this massive five million win bonus at the end. Did you know yeah. about that? I, just, yeah, maybe keep some of the fortune then i think he got the most he got a, a load of money of that because he was the most he played the most games i think or something i remember him getting a really big share of that like 400 wow. grand um, wow. but, um i thought it was publicized at the time i think um but um yeah i do remember that tony parks uh yeah really really decent man a- again yeah. you know really really lovely fella um lovely to me lovely to to anyone uh great guy um it was kind of weird because initially when grayson went steve thompson was sort of meant to be the main man and it kind of just Steve's almost Steve was almost too nice to say yes I want to do it and he kind of let Tony sort of sort of take over in a way and Steve became that sort of faithful number two again uh, which I think is a role Steve does really well actually and he's probably what what he's suited to best so maybe it worked out for the best I don't know but yes Steve Thompson was meant to be kind of the main man and they did all right didn't they it was again it was a struggle but they managed to stay up and like you just said um they bought some great players and didn't they so um mm. so they yeah. saw they almost sort of kickstart. You definitely could argue they kickstarted what was to come. I, yeah. I don't think. I, I don't think they would have got them to where they, you know, it needed some magic dust sprinkled on it uh, by some sort of maverick. Uh, you know, the guy who did team talks with the chickens and, and teddy bears uh, to come <laughs> in and do that. Um, so I'm not sure Stephen Tony would have taken them much further, but but certainly they laid the foundations. Because if you look at the, the players in that team now uh, that started. Mm. You think bloody hell there were some good players there weren't they? i mean yeah. really good you know you just describe them as nobodies which i don't know why you've said that but actually there's some oh they were great players yeah players. I, mean, I, I mean they were amazing but it was almost as if he made them great great greater than they were yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Know, you know they yeah. played unbelievable football i mean i don't know what it was like for you i'm i'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you obviously you know the two nottingham forest uh, you know the, the two semi-final games and and the final i mean you're covering them as a journalist could you see it? Could you believe it? I suppose, as what well, you were reporting, was it like beyond anything yeah. you could dream? You got to get in the yeah, Premier League, of course. It was. I, I we, we kept saying, This is this is what Blackpool, we nah, it's not gonna, no, they're never gonna go up. You know, it was just it was brilliant. And if Will's still listening, me and Will were sort of in this together because we were sort of worked together closely at that point and went to all the away games together. And yeah, and every week, and, and Will's, um, you know, a Blackpool fan, and he was uh, he we were just loving it, it was fantastic. Uh, and um. Yeah, it was great. It was a brilliant time to be alive, as they say. It was uh, it was fantastic because suddenly this club, you know, I'd gone from the Steve McMahon days of hating my job a little bit and then the Colin Andrew days where you're thinking, well, we'll probably be in the non-league soon. And then you suddenly, a few short years later, having the time of your life, um, watching this team play the most fantastic football. You've got Charlie Adam and DJ Campbell knocking in the goals and, you know, um, the great midfield. Was David Vaughan, David Vaughan was that year, wasn't he? Must have been. Or oh, Vaughan come yes. later. Yeah, Vaughan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes, Vaughan came in, yeah. Yeah, David Vaughan, Keith Southern, Charlie Adam. What a midfield three that is, you know. And that oh. and that Keith Southern, you know, who, who had always been a real, you know, heart on the sleeve player. But suddenly, those two made, you know, Keith Southern did their dirty work and the three of them as a, as a pairing, as a, as a uh, trio, worked absolutely yeah. superb. And then you've got your, your back four with Ever and, uh, you yeah. know, and Stephen Craney. And, yeah, what, what a great team. Um, yeah. So... How it happened, I'm still not quite sure. But you know, it, it, Holloway obviously came in. He'd had a year out of football after Leicester, um, and uh, and and you know, he, he just he told us what he was going to do. You know, he got to have his fullbacks whacking it, so his right fullback could be doing long diagonal passes over to the left, vice versa. You stretch the teams, you play down the fans, and he did it. He did it exactly the way he said he was going to do it, and it worked. So you know, it's not just about his man management and his instilling confidence. It was he, he had the tactics to back it up. You know, yeah. and. You could argue that they got found out eventually in the Premier League, but but bloody hell, what a great ride to go on! And that Championship season was um, was was unbelievable. It was something else, and and the end to it just and some of the football. I remember beating Swansea. I think five one. Swansea were like the, the rivals. Yes, to get that yes, at home. Yeah, yeah. We well, yeah, we picked them on the last day. 
yeah, that, we, yeah, that was that was nerve wracking, wasn't it? Because we mucked up, didn't we? We only drew one all with Bristol City, I think. Uh, Nicky yeah, Mayner. I think they missed a penalty, didn't they? At the, right, right near the death, yeah. yeah. Probably shouldn't have even been in those playoffs. Uh, no. But but yeah, but once he got in, you know, they, they were obviously you could see the, the momentum because they've beaten Nottingham Forest, haven't they? In the run yes. up in the last few games, and they've looked so much better than them. And you knew in the playoffs they were going to do them. Um, and then the Cardiff game, obviously, was absolutely nail biting as they come, but. Um, but they just managed to cling on, didn't they? Uh, helped by the fact who was the lad that played for Jay Boffroyd, was it? He limped off in the early on. He was a big threat and he limped off for Cardiff. Yes, he uh, did. Yeah, he did. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Here. And my favourite <laughs> bit of that entire season was at, at Wembley when they, when they actually, you know, the full time whistle went, the beating Cardiff. And the, the the PA announcer, you know, and he's excited. So saying, and Blackpool are in the Premier League. And honestly, there was no cheering just for a few seconds. It was like this. This shock, <laughs> are we? <laughs> and then, of course, you know, all hell breaks loose, and it, and it was so amazing. I, I could barely write with a pen at the end because, as a journalist, and I wasn't a Blackpool fan, obviously, you're meant to stay objective and neutral. But you know, me and Will and Wembley going, yeah, come on. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was brilliant. It was, uh, it, it, was incre- it, it was incredible. Uh, just a couple of comments here. I'll just say uh, uh, some people actually writing to you. So, Philip Wall says, Steve, I love your style of writing. The first half was completely relevant to the match. And it was, wasn't it? It was, it was, it was you like, didn't you? you like the story. Oh, yeah. Everyone. I loved the, the setting, the scene, isn't it? Uh, so, so. Michael Haig says, uh, Steve, uh, caravan, I hope you're well, pal. You're still living where the birds fly upside down. So, do you know, Michael, do you know, do you know him? I, know. I don't know. Martin, definitely Michael. I know Martin Haig. Um, Steve, hope you're well, pal. Still, when the birds fly upside down, I have no idea what that means. What, what that means. Okay, so we don't know. Okay. Thank you to Philip for his comment as well. Uh, but yeah, um, um, the birds fly upside down. Is that is that sort of story? I think he, does he mean St. Anne's? I think I've heard him say that oh, before. Okay. Right, well, well, you do, don't you? So, yes. Um, uh, Steve Hutchins says hi to Steve from one of your former Seaside Six scribes. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was I was in the Seaside Six <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello, Steve. yeah, you were Jane. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. We used to have that every every I think it was every Thursday something in the paper. And, uh, yeah, yeah. That was, that was another thing that Steve McMahon went ballistic about. He used to hate the fact that that fans, you know, with no knowledge of football, as he would put it, you know, were able to criticise the team. Uh, yeah, he didn't, he didn't like that at all. <laughs> no, Steve Huntley said, "How do you rate today's team and manager?" I suppose you you won't watch much of it, will you? Or, or, or are you watching yeah, quite? Honestly, I've, I've actually started to, you know, now that now they're flying, uh, I've started to take a bit more interest. But but I, I deliberately made the decision that when so my last game was the 2012 playoff final. Oh, actually, it was Keith Sullivan's testimonial actually for later in that summer. Um, but I sort of made a conscious decision to switch off because I knew I would have missed it too much. Um, otherwise, because um, it was it was a, a, a decision that was I had to take anyway. Um, so I sort of switched off, and I and I and I continued to switch off, and I've just sort of started to take a bit more um, a, a, a attention lately. But I think it was a really good forward thinking appointment. Um, really interesting. I'm glad he's been given a bit of time because I, I, you know, I know a few people are Blackpool fans, and a couple of them were grumbling it earlier in the season. Yeah, uh, they were. Glad he's been given the time, uh, and from what I can gather, they're playing really well. And uh, uh, my wife's a big Blackpool fan, so I dare say. If they do make it to uh, to the to the final and we're allowed to go, then then I'll be there. All right. Okay. Brilliant. Um, just a few last questions, really. I think to, to um, can you tell us what the, the the facilities were like in the Premier League? What was it like? A whole different world, completely. Uh, and, and what was it like dealing with the interest from the national press as well? You know, were they badgering you for stories and stuff? Because obviously it, it was quite a, a surprise story, Blackpool, wasn't it? Because because they didn't reckon we'd even win a corner, did they? You know, before we went in, they said they won't even win a corner. And so what yeah. was it like? It was great for me because, um, yeah, I, you know, prior to th- that Premier League time, basically when we went to a press conference, there was me, someone from Radio Lancashire and the press officer for Blackpool. That was it. Or maybe Radio Wave occasionally when they when they were there. Um so you get to the Premier League, uh, and and yeah, there's all these journeys from that you've never seen before. So good lads, but you soon learned there was a kind of thing that you had to do. So you know, I used to get a go to a press conference, pick out my best lines, which a journalist does, and think right, I'll use that tomorrow, I'll use that the next day, whatever. And I remember printing some stuff early on and getting getting told by the national lads, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. We all agree what we're going to work. So if you look in national papers, you'll see they, they generally cover the same story, and that's because there's an agreement between the press that they'll save that story for a certain day, that story for that day. So I kind of upset the apple cart a bit, but they were okay. I remember there was a really good, on the eve of that Premier League season, I remember in the sponsors lounge doing a five live special um, with Colin Murray chairing it, Jimmy Arnfield, Pat Nevin, um, oh, wow. someone else good. 
and then me, Perry Groves, and then someone, then me, little old me. And I remember sitting there, my mum and dad were listening and stuff, and I remember thinking, I feel so out of place. These, these are like proper good professional people, and they've got this scally on the end. Uh, <laughs> made me realise how good Colin Murray was as a broadcaster as well. He was so shy. But that, that things like that were great. And Mark Chapman interviewed me. I was sort of part of the Five Live team when they played City at home. Um, wow. And so, you know, some really, on a personal level, uh, as a journalist, some really sort of good stuff. Um, so I enjoyed that. Um, but tricky. So I also got a ghost wrote Ian Holloway's column. He did a column in The Independent on Sunday, and I wrote that for a couple of years. So that was really uh, enjoyable. Oh. I've not written for a national paper before. Um, and that allowed me to get to know Holloway a lot better because I would always stay behind after the press conference and ha have half an hour or an hour with him one-on-one. -on -one, or I went to his... You know him and Kim had a house, and I used to go go there and stuff. And it was that was quite nice. Um, I kind of forgotten the first half of that question. Oh, facilities. Um, yeah, amazing. And and yeah, you know, Blackpool had to play the first few games away, didn't they? Because they had to. Mm. Yeah. And then they ready. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, surprisingly. Eh? Uh, <laughs> well, it was a miracle they got it ready at all, to be honest, because it, was, it wasn't there, was it, before yeah, the start? Well, yeah, that was a great moment at Wigan, wasn't it? That first game, four 0 yeah, and they were top yeah. of the table, yeah. weren't they? Until the yeah. time, yeah. And uh, that was a great day. So yeah, the facilities. Yeah, going to I remember going to Arsenal. I think it was the first or the second or the first uh, proper away game because Wigan should have been at home. I think shouldn't it? And they played it away. And yes. They played where he had ever got sent off after about ten minutes, and they got hammered six 0 But the fans were brilliant, and were just you know. Remember, I think uh, they about it afterwards, saying how good the Blackpool fans were. Um, but but at Arsenal, yeah, I went in the press room. Uh, bear in mind, I come, you know, I started when at Chesterfields and Barnsley, where you get a, a, yeah. a pot pie, and that Arsenal gave you a menu to, to me uh, with a four course meal, and I said, you know, I have the steak and the sticky toffee pudding for them, and they bought the, uh, a waiter wearing white gloves, bought this meal, and I'm thinking, it's some, you know, I, I've come from, and then, and then when they come back to Black <laughs> later in the season, they get and they get like filled up tuna sandwich. Um, so it was, uh, it was. It was, it was Interesting how the other half live, but I've got to say, I, I always, I, I much preferred, lo I preferred the lower leagues. I always preferred the lower leagues. Yeah, the people, the people are nicer. The conversations, the funny stories. I, I never like life to be too professional. Um, we've, so, yeah. We've been doing some non-league because Jane went to work for Chase Town as a, as a match secretary. So we've been doing these non-league diaries just, just before lockdown. You know, we've gone to see quite a few clubs and film there and interviewed the managers and the, the owners and everything. And it's it's even non-league, is I would say, is even better. You know, the people are just so down to earth there. And they're all volunteering, you know, to, to, to help the club out. And they're wonderful, aren't they? Oh, yeah. It's definitely the lower down you go, the more real the people are and the warmer the people are. Oh, yeah. and it's 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 wonderful. They can't do I mean, even uh, when I was at Chase, we played a team because we were in the Northern Premier League Division One South, and we played a team from the Northern Premier League Premier League in the Cup, uh, which was um, I think it was Gainsborough, and they had Harry Maguire's brother playing for them, and he was like the big star of the game. And we went there, and we had to sit down for a meal there. And I'm thinking, I'm not used to this. I'm just used to just wandering around, maybe have a you know have a cup of tea in a <sighs> in a plastic thing that I, I carry around with me, and maybe yeah. some soup out of a vat at half time. And and I was expected to sit down for this meal. I'm like, well, this no, I, I can't cope with this. I, I, yeah. You know, I much prefer the the informality of yeah. it. Yeah, the same. I much prefer the tea from a, from a plastic cup than the, than the fine china of Man yeah. City. And I don't. That's just me, probably. But um, yeah, and it's it was quite nice in a way. Actually, the the, the Blackpool thing, you know, the the fact that they got sort of not second rate facilities when they came to Blackpool was actually quite nice to see some of the big name journalists turn up and after sort of and, and be treated <sighs> like that because they they was they were sort of almost affronted. I remember someone wrote a really scathing report as the match report in the Daily Mirror or somewhere about oh. the. Facility. Is. And, it, and, it, and it was purely because the journalist didn't get his meal or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And you're thinking, yeah. there's something wrong with that. You're going to a football yeah. ground, you watch the football, you know. Uh, yes, stuff. exactly. Oh, you're not going really there for a meal, are you? Really? We're, just, we're just writing about it. So, you know, but, but if you work at that top level all the time, you become accustomed to a yeah. certain way of being treated. Yeah. And of course, yeah. when you become accustomed to something, you, it, it turns your head a bit. So, but I, so I always quite like the fact it was quite down to earth at Blackpool. But, but you know, with hindsight, that was probably a reflection of the way the club was run rather than uh, anything else, yeah. obviously. Yes, it was. It, it was. Um, right. You left in 2012, just before Ollie. Uh, was there a reason that you left? Had something shifted uh, or was it just just, just, just the timing of, of the two of you both kind of leaving? You and and just it. sort of how, how were things at the club after the Premier League, basically? And how did, you know, did it 
were the bad feelings around the club because a lot of people left. You know, all the players left, you left, Matt left, Ollie left. What you know? What was the atmosphere like, really? It, it was uncertain, wasn't it? I remember. Um, I don't even recall. I wrote a stupid song that summer about Blackpool FC off to Wembley, uh, which was which. Because I, I mentioned this because after they'd been beaten by West Ham and Ian Holloway done his press conference, he came across to me and he and he hugged me just before they got the coach. And he said, so he just lost out on going back to the Premier League. Uh, and, and he said, absolutely brilliant song that. We had it on in the coach all the way. It's a great song. And I thought it's kind of quite nice to say that, given how, what the personal disappointment he was suffering in that moment. But he also said something on the lines of he, wouldn't, he didn't think he'd be here much longer. And, and that kind of... I remember that. And it, for me, it was a combination of, it wasn't any, um, you know, not looking to a, foot, a, a ball to see what was going to future. Uh, I didn't know how bad it was going to get, but it, it felt like an actual time for me. I'd done it 10 years. I, I thought Holloway was going to go. Um, Cause I remember almost really regretting it. Cause when I, that following season, they started like a train, didn't they? And then yeah, they were yeah. going great. Uh, so I, I was a lot of the time I was thinking, Oh no, what have I done? They're going to go straight back up here and I'm going to miss out. Um, but, you know, obviously it came to pass that it, that it went the other way eventually. But, yeah, it did feel like, you know, uh, something something had, had changed and, and it was very uncertain. Um, yeah, there was a distinct feeling in the air that the, the, the sort of um, the good times were kind of maybe coming to an end. Uh, mm. And it's such a shame because talk about f- narrow margins. They should have won that game at Wembley. Did they? Oh, should've. yes. I oh, think yes. comments missed some great chances. There was they did. Uh, or certainly had the better chances, uh, yeah, and, then they, yeah, they on, um, and it was it, you know I would have certainly stayed, obviously, um, and yeah. uh, it had gone up, and and a lot of obviously the players and, and whatnot. It, so it's fine lines, isn't it? But I guess you can mm. say that this year and the Cardiff game and whatnot. So that's football, isn't it? But um, but yeah, you, you definitely there was definitely something in the air. There was definitely something in the air. Although that, that said, like I say, the next season it looked like they were just going to come straight back up. For yeah, which is weird with you saying that Holloway was kind of or making noises he, he was going because because we were playing such amazing football before just before he left and I can't believe he left. You know, it, it was we were so good, weren't we? You know, we battered Leeds United. Uh, the uh, it, Battered Middlesbrough six and I think it wasn't. You know, their manager said in their paper that you know whoever comes second to Blackpool is going to get promoted because he was convinced we were going to walk the league, and it all just went sour. But I didn't realise he was in that sort of frame of mind in, in the summer. I think, really. said, I think he said it in an emotive way. You know, obviously later in that summer something happened to change his mind, and and he started off again. I mean, Will what you need to get him on because he he took up taken over by that point and knew a lot more than me. I deliberately switched off. But yeah, I remember speaking to Will and how well they were playing and it, they looked odds on, didn't they, to go straight back yeah. up. Oh, yeah, That's dude. why it was so heartbreaking, really, when he when he left. It when was. He it, it was, and then he went and took Crystal Palace up. No. Oh, anyway, a quick, quick uh, last couple of questions and then hopefully you, you, you'll you be able to sing, sing us out. I know you've got somewhere to be at nine o'clock. So, uh, just, yeah, we are, we are conscious the, the of last, time. The last couple of questions. Um, did you make any long-term friends at, at Blackpool and do you keep in ta- contact with, any, with anyone in particular? Well, yeah, Matt Williams still know very well. Um, Will Watt, obviously, but he was more a mate of the Gazette than than uh, than anything else. But uh, yeah, Will, uh, not and uh, Stuart Hudson's a press officer now. Yeah, still know Stuart quite well. Um, no, but then again, that's me. I don't really keep in contact with anyone. I'm a bit miserable, a bit of a loner. Um, so yeah, but no, everyone I dealt with, yeah, like I say, very very few uh, bad relationships with anyone. Um, Apart from it, Steve McMahon. <laughs> You know, and, and the staff were always great. Uh, some lovely people there, yeah. From you know, Phil on and the physio, I've got them great with, and uh, even walking the front, the front office. You know, they're, they're just normal people doing it, doing a job, aren't they? It, it was fine. But no, I, I but I've not really kept other than Matt Williams, not really kept in touch with anyone. But that's more me than them. I, I'm not really good at keeping in touch with people. Right, fine. And uh, I think Jane wants to know uh, what have you done since you left, and what are you doing presently? I think you've already touched on it. Are you you're actually t- teaching journalism? Yeah. Are you now? Is it? Is, I'm going to get through this whole interview without uh, being asked about Oyster. This, I'm amazed. I was bracing myself for the big. <laughs> we well, that's, fine. that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Do we ask I, about I, no, no. Jane didn't want to. Jane didn't want to ask about. I, I've, I've moved <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> you put me out of an August spot. That's good. Um, no, I I went to the BBC. So I became a feature writer, and then when I went to the BBC for a couple of years, and then a job came up teaching journalism or leading the sports journalism course at, at UCLan in Preston, the university course there. So I've done that. I've done that for about four or five years now. In fact, um, so trying to teach the journalists of tomorrow how to do it. Billy, uh, some people hollowly laugh when I tell them I'm teaching journalists, uh, but yeah, that's what I'm doing. Trying to teach people how to write about sport. Believe it or not. 
Do you still play in a band? Because you, you used to play in a band, didn't you? I do, yes, I do. Well, yeah, if you can call it a band, yeah. We, we, yeah, we're not very good, but yeah, I, I've always loved music. I always play guitar, uh, and uh, yeah, it's like hobbies. And everyone needs something away from the job and whatnot to get through life. So yeah, I play in a band. I write songs. I sing. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't sing, but I try and sing. Uh, so yes, uh, I do. That's my big hobby: playing guitar and writing songs. All right. So would you, would you like to play us out? <sighs> You didn't tell me you're going to do this. <laughs> what, what was the old? Oh God! What was the old Blackpool song? I can't remember. You played it now. Blackpool FC off to Wembley, where we'll face West Ham. Preston, no one rates us. Preston hates us. We don't give a damn. I can't remember anymore. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that was ten years ago, almost. But um, yeah, that's as good, good on the on the spur of the That was fantastic. Stevie, yeah. you've been an absolute pleasure. It, honestly, it's been fantastic. Some fantastic stories. I hope uh, if you're watching this, you tell all your Blackpool friends because people can watch this on the rerun. You know, it's still, you know, it's still, it still will be here forever to watch it back and everything. So it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Yeah, it's been lovely. Thank you very much for your time and and thank you for for the ten years as well writing about Blackpool because you brought a lot of pleasure to to a lot of people through through your words, which is you know it's so important. That's very kind. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for, for watching. Oh, just another, just before we go, I uh, just didn't check any last, was there any last uh, com uh, questions? I don't want to go, oh. No, I think that's it. I think we've done it all. Oh, hang on. Oh, oh. oh Eugene well, McGeever says, there you are. What, what do you think of Chris Sutton and Robbie Savage on BT Sports uh, score on a Saturday afternoon? Well, I, I, I don't watch it. I, I don't watch it. I'm sorry to say. I, I, uh, we do know Chris Sutton actually through through the course, and he, he's great. He puts on a real just he's an act. He puts on a persona to for his TV uh, stuff, uh, but he's great in real life. Uh, no, I don't watch it. I'm afraid I've got two kids under the age of three. Uh, my Saturday afternoons are spent watching Peppa Pig and Paw Patrol. Ah. <laughs> True story. Right. We're going to go to the outro. Steve, if you want to stay on, we can have a little chat with you after, or if you've got to get off. Yeah, he's got to go to his, his oh, folk club at nine o'clock. Yes, your folk club, so. yes. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks again. Happy thanks, Stephen. Uh, uh, thanks for, everybody for watching. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>